Okay. So let's start. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking the organizers for their kind invitation to let me speak today about Exact. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be talking about Exact here today in this conference. So here I am at home in Champaign, Illinois, where the uh, headquarters of Wolfram Research are. Uh, I now work for Wolfram Research since 10 years ago. Actually, in, in two more weeks, it will be exactly 10 years. Time flies. And um, we are working remotely since March. It, it wasn't difficult for a company like us, very used to uh, Zoom meetings, to um, to change to work remotely, but the disadvantage is that my um, home internet connection is not so good. So when I both share video and the screen, uh, the bandwidth is, is not enough. So I will stop sharing my video and will just uh, show the um, screen for the uh, rest of the talk. I mean, uh, during some um, questions, we may switch the video again if, if needed. Uh, okay, so I do that and share my screen. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so the plan of the talk is the following. I will spend um, uh, around 15 minutes or so first introducing exact in general. And then uh, I will uh, move on to uh, a more demonstrational part uh, in relation to the two main packages of the system. I will explain in a moment what all these packages do. And then I will conclude with uh, examples with some other important packages. I will not be able to cover all of them. There are 20 now, um, but I will show the, the um, the, the two main ones and examples with two, a few more. And then I will conclude with some conclusions and, and future plans on the development of Exact. Okay, so let's go for a quick introduction. First, the history of Exact. The project started in early 2002 well, while I was a postdoc at the University of Southampton. The initial projects that drive the development were perturbation theory and the search for formulations of the Einstein equations, both in collaboration with Karsten Goodlach. And um, by that time, the, I was planning to call the system extensor. Reinhard Briggs, who was a postdoc in Southampton at that time, taught me about uh, GPL and licensing and suggested that I change the name to extensor, and he had started the search for funny words that start or contain an X in the system. Paolo Matucci, who was a PhD student in the group at that time, suggested that I look at some uh, papers published in the archive by Renato Portugal on how to use group theory algorithms to canonicalize indices. In retrospect, this may have been the most important suggestion ever for exact, because these algorithms is where exact gains its power from. So, so I started learning about group theory and coding computational group theory algorithms. And at some point, there were more, there was more code about the group theory than about tensor. So I split the project in two. So that's where the package expern was born. And so I renamed the whole project exact. Well, of course, ACT are the reversed initials of tensor computer algebra. That's the origin of the name. Um, the first public release was March 2004 with these two packages. And uh, two early adopters of Exact were Alfonso Garcia Parrado and Guillaume Fay. And I have to thank them for so many suggestions on how to uh, improve and shape the systems. They, they, they really influenced me. And then uh, from 2004 to 2010, there were many additions. Exact evolved very fast. And since I work for Wolfram Research, uh, it has evolved slower, at least on my part. But fortunately, the community keeps growing. And there are by now many um, uh, users who are strong enough to develop more packages. And so now more than half of the packages 
do not have me as an offer, which I think is great. As I said, there are now 20 packages. So the main resource for, for Exact is its web page, which is this one. And uh, so here you have uh, documentation and notes about all packages. We will um, have a look at them in a moment. You have the f uh, latest uh, versions of the system, both for uh, Linux, Unix, and Mac, or for Windows. Here there is a file with uh, installation notes, so essentially telling you where to install them. And, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm being told that this is too, too small, so I can I increase this. I hope that's better. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for timing. Um, I, I, perhaps uh, feel free to, to uh, use a voice during the the, the talk. Uh, I mean, it's, it feels more interactive and nicer. Um, yeah, but thanks. So, as, as I was saying, um, yeah, these are the two files where you can download versions containing the whole system. You just have to untar the the files in, in one of the directories uh, noticed here for each of the operating systems. And then um, we have um, other pages about which packages we have, downloads. There, there is a lot of, of documentation. Um, there is documentation about the whole system with notes from previous courses. Um, for example, I've placed here in this two, in this line the file that, which is actually this one, the file I'm using during this talk. So this is the file with outputs, and I'm using a version of the file that doesn't have output, outputs. So if you want to run the examples as I run them during this talk, just download this file here. So other people have given courses. For example, here there is a, a course uh, by Alfonso at the University uh, of Prague. Um, some introductions by Teake, uh, Jolion, um, Barry, etc. So there are uh, documentation files for many of the um, packages. So they are these doc files, et cetera. Uh, this is an interesting page in which I, every few weeks I go to the archive and just search for uh, the names of the packages and the name of Exact and see if there are new articles that cite the use of Exact. And so, so I, I only look in archive, but uh, most of the articles are placed there. So I have found so far more than 500, and including almost uh, 29 theses, and um, I put them here. So these are the articles on the packages themselves, and these are articles which acknowledge the use of uh, Exact, of, of any of the packages in Exact. So I, I think this is a good collection for you to have a look and see if other authors in your same area have used the package already, because that may uh, give you an idea of the things that can be done. So, as I said, the first one was my work with Karsten on the formulations of Einstein equations, and generalizations of, of uh, things like BSSN, NOR, C4, etc. And, um, yeah, so these are recent papers from this year, there are now about 70, 80 per year. And these are the last ones, I just had a look this morning. Um, I see more or less half and half, GRQC and uh, HEPTH, and then sometimes there are other areas like astro pH uh, or some of the maths area. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that Exact is being used in areas I had never thought it would be used, like quantum uh, projects and uh, 
high energy physics projects. So yeah, it was it was designed only for JGR. And then here there are theses uh, that also acknowledge the use of exact. As I said, the rule to be in this page is 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 that the project uses exact. So reviews or people saying this could be done with exact, etc. They, they, they are not added here. So finally here there is a page with links to other systems on tensor computer algebra. Um, for Mathematica, Maple, other systems. So if, if you prefer to use other system other than, than Mathematica and the Wolfram language, uh, perhaps you can find here some alternative. Some reviews, in particular, there is this very nice reviews by Malcolm McCallum um, two years ago in Living Reviews. And uh, yeah, if you are new to Tensor Computer Algebra, I think this is a very good place to start and, and get a feeling of what the field is and the possibilities in the field. And finally, there are articles on, <coughs> sorry, how to canonicalize tensors and um, computational group theory. Okay, um, let's go back to the to the notebook. So that's the exact web page. Then there is a GitHub uh, page, which we call the page of contributions. And here um, there are packages that I don't even have in the exact web page, like these ones. Or for example, there are pages with examples notebooks to do various things. So that's another interesting page to look at. Um, th this is a page uh, maintained by Teake and uh, Leo Stein. We have a forum, a group, uh, uh, Google Groups, a Google Group, and uh, we are now more than 600 uh, people in the group. There are several thousand emails and um, this is another good place to get a feeling of how things are done. Of course, if you have any question, no matter how simple or advanced it is, feel free to post it here. And um, there are now many uh, strong users here of Exact that will answer, uh, not just me. And finally, some users prefer to post their questions in Mathematica Stack Exchange, one of the general forums for Mathematica and the Wolfram language. So that's another place. And so if, if I see a question there, I will try to answer them, uh, answer it too. Okay, so I think those four pages are the main resources for um, Exact. So what's the structure? Exact is a collection of packages. So Exact itself is not a package. It's a collection of packages. And so the idea is that when you load a package, any of them, it will automatically load any dependencies it has on the other packages. The structure is divided as follows. There are four main core packages. This is something just essentially for myself. These are tools for the general system. The package and permutation group theory that underlies the, the, the canonicalization proce uh, process. Extensor is the main package in the system. It's the one with which do we do abstract tensor computations. I, I'll explain in a moment what I mean by that. Then we have Excova, uh, which is the package which, with which we do component computations. Again, I will explain in the next slide what I mean by that. Then, so these packages call each other. They are organized in, in linearly in this way. So Excova depends on extensor and extensor depends on XPerm, etc. And then there are all these other application packages, which all depend on these four, but they don't, sometimes they depend on each other, but they don't have to. As I said, they know their dependencies, so you don't have to worry about that. So we have a, a package for metric perturbation theory, another one for tensor spherical harmonics, which was developed together with this one to do perturbation theory around spherical space times. We have one to manipulate invariants of the Riemann tensor. This is something I will demonstrate later in the tutorial. This is being used um, uh, quite a lot recently to to study uh, F of R theories and, and 
complicated scalars you can form with Riemann. One for spinor calculus, the type of Penrose um, um, to spinor calculus, complex spinor calculus. A, a package uh, for further tools for symmetrization of tensors. Then we have expand a package for cos cosmological perturbations in Newtonian gauge. Extras, which is some sort of um, collection of additions, of extensions of the system. This is very useful. Many people use that. Exterior is uh, a package uh, for exterior calculus. It adds differential forms, grades, and all these things to um, exact. Spin frames for the new and Penrose. Um, this is an extension of spinors to do more on, on spinor calculus, in particular these two frameworks. More on uh, perturbations and cosmology. One package on post-Newtonian uh, ex uh, gravity and effective field theory. And two recent packages, uh, one by metric relativity and another one just a few months ago to do fermions, gauge fields, and BRST commodes. So these are application packages. Some depends on others. For example, extras, extras will load, expert, and in-bar, etc. So they know their data dependencies. There are two packages which are about input-output. We have TechSact, which worries about uh, producing nice tech output for these huge expressions, tensorial expressions that we produce sometimes, and Xprint, which is a GUI interface to exact. And then there is this, um, um, sorry, there is this exceptional package. So uh, ADF, uh, which stands for uh, Algebra Value Forms, it's a package that Hugo Wolquist uh, developed in the early 2000s, but then um, he passed away in 2008, and his close collaborator, Frank Stabruck, sent it to me, asking what we could do so that it's available to the community. And so I improved the documentation and added, added it to Exact. So it's now one of the packages of Exact, even though it doesn't talk to any of the other packages. It's independent, but it has nice uh, capabilities that you may find useful if you need to work with algebra valid forms. So it's there, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's great that we all share these, these types of algorithms. Okay, so that's the collection of the current 20 packages available to Exact. And as I said, I'm authoring eight or nine of these, so so it's, it's and, and the, all the most recent ones are, have been developed by other people. So that's, that's a good sign of the health of exact. So the main difference about uh, the two types of computations are this abstract versus component computation. So let me explain what this is. Uh, by abstract computations, I mean dealing with tensor expressions and identities that are independent of choices of frames and of and or coordinates. For example, this is how expre an expression in, in, ex in exact looks. So here we have a covariant derivative. So that's the covariant index minus A. And then we have a tensor F with covariant indices B and C. And a vector field V with contravariant index C. Okay, so that's, uh, and here we see how it, uh, the Leibniz rule is automatically used. So now we multiply this expression by the vector VB. Does that, which is not much, just leave it there. And then to canonical, which is by far the most important function of the system, we'll worry about everything related about indices We'll look at all the symmetries of the tensors, uh, metrics, etc., if there are any, and we'll decide that this is the canonical form for that expression. So you see that we didn't have to specify any 
um, components, any bases, any charts. Uh, this could be even done in arbitrary dimension. So this is the type of computation I call abstract computation. Some of the people call it indicial computations. So these computations will be performed using abstract indices. And my inspiration here was always Wall's uh, relativ uh, general relativity book. So not only for the formalism of abstract indices, also for conventions we follow um, all the sign conventions. For example, Excite has various sign conventions that can be controlled. You can change the values of these variables and then the relation between Ricci and Riemann, for example, will change, etc. But these are the values that uh, Wald uses and they are the defaults in Excite. For spinors, we followed the um, Penrose and Rindler's uh, book, Spinors and Spacetime. So those are the two main uh, inspirational books for the development of Exact. So these are abstract computations, and this is where Exact excels in comparison with other systems. Then there are component computations. So these are com computations in which you start with some bases, some frames, some coordinate charts, and you have, say, the metric expressed in those coordinates. And so you are interested in now getting the curvature tensors, etc. So Exact has, we will look at this later in detail. So for example, this is a, 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 a two tensor. So this will denote a two tensor. This will denote a vector. This is slightly different in height. Means this is a contravariant, this is covariant. And something that always bothered me is that in most notations we use for, for matrices and vectors, it's very difficult to distinguish a vector from an M by one matrix. So the way I solve this is just by having a horizontal line when you have a matrix. And this is going to be useful because in exact, what we will do is that we will color the bases. So each basis we will have a different color. We will, you will be able to use many bases at the same time, many frames and change, do arbitrary changes between bases. And you will distinguish one from the others by names and in typesetting by colors. So this is very useful to realize that an expression is still basis dependent. If there is some colored part, it is potentially basis dependent. If it's black, then it's basis independent, it's geometric. So now we can form uh, expressions and perform operations as, as usual. So if we multiply this guy by that guy, it automatically returns that. If we multiply it by V again, it's a scalar, which because this was anti-symmetric, you see the, the signs here, it, it gives zero. Right? So this is the sort of computation that we will be doing for uh, component computations. This is what I call component computations. Okay. Um, right. So these two types of computations are very different. And traditionally, uh, most systems, they used to have two different packages, completely different, separate, to do that. So this is something I wanted to avoid. I mean, in exact, there are two different packages to do them, but you don't have to stop doing one type of computation to do the other. For example, I remember in Math Tensor there was a switch. You were able to do... Um, um, abstract computations up to some point, then you switched to component computations and, and part of the um, abstract computations were not available anymore. So in ex exact goes into a lot of trouble to avoid that. And the way we do this is, is more or less obvious. We just perform all component computations with the abstract tools, which at times will feel a bit heavy when we do uh, component computations. But it, it, it gives us a lot of freedom to perform anything we want. And finally, um, somebody said that differential geometry is the study of objects that stay invariant under changes of notation. So notation is a nightmare in this area. There are so very many ways to express things, and we use so many implicit things. When we do tensor calculus, we are always assuming implicitly what are the charts used, the metrics used, etc. So for a computer, this is very confusing. We must be always explicit in what we are using. And exact, again, goes into a lot of trouble, you will see. 
to follow that, and only in one place we break that rule, which is with metrics. You will see what I mean later. Okay, I'm almost done with my very quick introduction to the system. I can imagine that most of you already are familiar with uh, Wolfram language, but for those of you who are not, I have one slide dedicated to Wolfram language and Mathematica. So, um, so Wolfram language, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I'm here. Let me evaluate these tools and plots. Okay. So, these are the versions of Mathematica. Mathemat the first version of Mathematica is from the summer of eight 1988, and here we see how the various versions have been advancing, and um, here we see the number of symbols as time goes on, and here you see up to version 5, here the system was improving the, 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 the performance, not increasing very much the number of symbols, but improving the internals again and again and again. Here there was this change of of, of, of behavior in which we, this is where Wolfram Alpha was introduced, and we started covering other domains of the, of the, of the system, like now, geography, image processing, video, this type of things. Now the, the system is growing faster. Um, this is where I joined, at last, 2010. And so by now there are almost 6,000 symbols. So this makes the, the language very expressive, very powerful, uh, but also more difficult to learn than, than C. Say. So the the heads, what do we call the, the symbols in the language, are, are formed by joining words in this way, what do we call camel case, and uh, always starting with capitals. And here we see a, a word cloud of the main words used in the language. So here we see the uh, how many uh, statistical distributions we have, data functions covering these domains I was talking about, image processing, um, the, the very many areas that, that, that are covered in the system. So the organizing idea of the system is, the, is this, that we call everything is an expression. What do we mean by that? So let's take something like this. Um, we can expand it. We can uh, ask about the numeric approximation with 20 digits. And now let's look at what we call the full form of the expression. It has this form. You see, this thing here is expressed in this way. So we have three halves, rational, three two. Um, we have uh, a power of, of one half, that's the square root. We have another power with exponent seven, that's the outermost thing. And you see how in this language, the, the internal language, there are no parentheses. They are never needed. What we do is that functions have brackets and arguments. And this is the global unifying idea of the language. Everything has a head and arguments. So for example, one argument, another argument. And this whole thing is called an expression. Both the functions and the data are expressions. And this allows us to express anything we want as long as we can express it via an expression, which we can always, of course. So for example, if we do some integration, we can differentiate. You see, it will do the differentiation, but we're not bother to, to put together the expression again. So we can use simplify, which will be uh, an important function for us. And again, that's just to express this in this way. You see, everything is always a head, uh, an argument, another argument. I will use three ways of applying a function to an argument. This is the standard one with brackets, always square brackets, never parentheses. That's the way we can distinguish whether we have a parentheses or a function application. This is the prefix notation. This also means exactly the same thing, f applied to the function, to the variable x or this is postfix notation, the function applied to the variable x. These three things are the same thing. Okay, 
Something that will be very important for us in terms of computations are polynomial computations. This is another thing in which uh, the buffer language is quite fast. So here we have some polynomial expressed in, in, in various ways. And we have these two functions. Expand, we'll convert it into an expanded form. Simplify, we'll try to express it in the shortest possible way. So these two are opposite of each other. We will be using them frequently with tensors. And finally, one of the most important things on the bottom language, and which is extremely useful to manipulate uh, indices, is pattern matching and rules. So this is an example of a rule. Imagine that we have a tensor T and indices A and B here. So if we have a rule like this and, and expressions like those, now I can apply the rule in this way, but is the, re is the rule going to apply to both cases? You see, both are a pair of tensors of two indices with a minus here in one of them, a covariant index in, in front. So this applies to the first one, but not to the second one. This is because it's looking for a minus in the first, uh, and this index must be equal to that index. This is obeyed by this one, minus in the first. The index here is the same. Uh, Mathematica knows that the, pro the times product is commutative, so it doesn't matter in which order I, I write them. But this one, uh, you see, this has this one and that one. They are both in the first argument, so the rule doesn't match. This type of manipulation is very powerful, and um, we will use it in internally at least a lot in exact. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there are very many other things in, in, in the bottom language that are very important for tensor manipulations. I will explain a few of them as we go along. And, uh, but yeah, I, I will um, stop here with my uh, introduction to exact. Okay, is there any question at this point? No? Okay, so then let's go to the uh, tutorial of exact. And we will ex start with extensor, the package for abstract computations. So if exact has been correctly installed, you can load the uh, extensor with this command. And so what we get here are uh, copyright messages of the various packages. In this case, I loaded e extensor and it knows it has to load the package for permutation group theory. You see the versions that are being used, etc. So this is very noisy. So there are there are ways of uh, avoiding all these uh, uh, info commands if you want. Okay. So how do we start? Uh, the buffer language is an untyped language, so it doesn't have a type system that we can use. So extensor develops its own internal type system in order to keep track of whether something is a vector, sorry, a tensor, a manifold, a vector bundle, whatever. So the first thing that we have to do is to define a manifold. This is done with def manifold. The manifold will be called M. We can have, uh, it, it will have dimension four, and we will use these indices in its vector bundle. So we do that, and we uh, are informed that the manifold has been created, and in the process, a ta a, the, it, its tangent bundle, called tangent M, has been defined. So the indices are attached to that, and now we can define tensors. Something important is that a symbol cannot have two meanings. So once we have used, for example, G as an index, it cannot be a tensor anymore. So we will not be able to use G as a metric. However, we will be able to define some other symbol as a metric and ask that the type setting is G. This may seem confusing at, at, at first, but it's very useful. We'll see later. Okay, so we define a vector field with a contravariant index A and it's a field on the manifold M. If we have several manifolds, it can be a manifold on the product of them. So now that's going to be typeset like that, and that's typesetting. Internally, it's still like that. It's always an expression. Head, V, 
argument index A. So the, the delta tensor, it's the most important tensor, is, is already defined for all manifolds. And for example, we can do things like that, right? So the contraction of the delta with V is automatic. If we trace the two indices of delta, we get the dimension back, which was four because we wrote it here. We, we can define a manifold with a symbolic dimension. So you can do computations with, with uh, symbolic D, symbolic dimension. So how, we do, how do we define uh, more complicated tensors. So, for example, here we have F with two contravariant, sorry, two covariant indices, and it's going to be antisymmetric in the indices minus A and minus B. You can also say one and two if, if you prefer to number them. So again, that's F, and from now on, I'm going to use something else called input form rather than the full form, because the full form is a bit too heavy with this times thing. So here we see the covariant indices nicer. So I will use input form instead of full form. But it's, it's just a, some sort of intermediate way. Um, right. So this symbol is very useful in both language. It means the previous output. This means two previous outputs. So if, if, this, if we are in input 37, that refers to output 35. Okay, so now this allows defining tensors. We can have um, a general language. So, exact has a general language of symmetries. You can define any symmetry you want. And um, you can have tensors with you know, hundreds of indices if needed. Um, okay, so. How do we do canonicalization? And actually, there is a, a question in chat about that. So it works this way. So for example, imagine that we have FBA. We know that FBF is an antisymmetric tensor. Exact is not going to try, by default, to change the symmetry. This is an expensive operation. And if you have an expression with, I don't know, 100,000 tensors, you don't want all of them automatically to start thinking about whether they are in canonical form or not. So we want to control when the actual canonicalization computations happen. We do it with tocanonical, as I said, the most important function of the system. Tocanonical knows everything about the tensors. It will decide that the canonical form of FBA is actually minus FAB. Same thing here. So if we have this product, um, tocanonical will know that that's zero. Notice, because we are using the standard times product in Mathematica, which is represented by this uh, phantom cross here. It reorders. It reorders alphabetically, effectively. OK, um, let's define more objects. Uh, covariant vector and a tensor with a mixed character. Um, OK, so I have more questions in chat. Um, so here we have this expression, which has now a variety of dummy indices, uh, etc. So we do to canonical, and what to canonical does, this is important, is that it first expand. Remember the command expand the expression, then it will act on individual terms, because for to canonical this is just a tensor product of tensors, so it's a tensor itself. It will explore the symmetries of the whole thing, and find the canonical form of the tensor. Right? And then it will return an expression, which is expanded, of this form. Now, simplify, the standard mathematical simplify, will be able to treat this as if it was a polynomial, and just collect things as it finds fit. But it's important to s separate these two steps. This is purely exact, purely tensorial, this is purely polynomial, purely uh, buffer language. The combination of two, which is what m most peop many people want, is simplification. And so you can do both things, st starting from this expression, you can do both in a single go. However, for very, very large expressions, it's good to separate them because both may take a long time. And if the expression is very large, this one may take a lot longer than that one. Because in a sense, this is linear. 
in the in the number of terms. It will act one by one on the terms, while this one has to look at the whole expression at the same time. So if the expression is very large, this becomes uh, combinatorially uh, very difficult. So yeah, to canonical is in general what you should try first. Okay, we have seen tens of fields. Now let's work with covariant derivatives. Well, um, at, at, at some points, I would like to stop. If you have questions, please do use voice. We can discuss things and how to do things. And perhaps if you are, if you have downloaded this file, perhaps you are trying to follow what uh, I'm doing. Um, so yes, before I go to covariant derivatives, let's stop for a moment and see if there are questions. I will have a look at the, at the chat. How do you undefine the expression? Yes, good question. So yes, everything that is defined in extensor can be undefined. So let's take, for example, I don't know, this W. So I can go here and then there and do undef tensor W and it will undefine the tensor. So notice something that happened here. This is pure Borfram language. It became blue. When a symbol is blue, it means it doesn't have any definitions attached. If, if, if it's black, it has definitions attached. Once a tensor has been undefined, it can be defined again. Right? Now I have defined it again. If I try to define it again while it is defined, we will complain that the symbol is already used. I mean, no matter if you try to define it as a, you know, an index or, or a metric or whatever, it will say, no, it's already used. Okay, there are no more questions. So let's continue. So how do we handle covariant derivatives? So the first thing to, to notice here is that covariant derivatives or, or connections do not necessarily derive from a metric, and this is not assumed here. So this is going to represent a, a, a connection, capital C, capital D, and there is a, a standard typesetting, which is in postfix notation is a semicolon, in prefix notation is a standard nabla, but you can choose whatever you want. So Yes, this defined a connection. So together with a connection, we define its standard tensors. So the torsion of the connection, the Christoffel of the connection, we, we will discuss in a moment about Christoffels, the Riemann tensor of the connection. Notice how it has the index configuration used by Wald. So minus A, minus B, minus C, D. So the upper index is at the end. And because this covariant derivative does not derive from a metric, the only symmetry it has is anti-symmetry in the first pair. So it has a Ricci, which for the same reason is not symmetric. And it tells us that if we contract this, in, uh, this index with one of those two of Riemann, it will convert automatically into Ricci. So this is how a covariant derivative works and how it looks. Notice that it's a capital D because I, I chose here capital D. For example, if I do this, then all my covariant derivatives will look like that. Again, there is a bar there because I, I chose a bar there. But let's keep the default for a moment. So this is prefix notation. So we will still use uh, indices here in front. So for example, this is the Leibniz rule. This is what I was showing before. Right? So this is the covariant derivative of a product, which is converted into the sum of two products, and now we multiply by VB and ask to canonical, and to canonical will, will realize that this term dies, right? because F is anti-symmetric. That's a very simple situation. Okay. Um, so let's look at these associated tensors. So this is something that um, exact does a lot which is creating tensors with a common first part and then the name of the associated structure. So this is the torsion, uh, the, the Christoffel, uh, etc. So we didn't ask for any torsion. So 
Toshani Zero. This is the Christopher, the Riemann, and the Ricci. We keep D here inside because, of course, we can work with many, many um, covariant derivatives at the same time. So we need to distinguish the Ricci of one from the Ricci of the other one. So we do it this way. For example, let's do something like, yes, let's add these two objects with these two indices reversed. And we ask two canonical about it. So because two canonical knows the symmetries of Riemann, um, it will return zero. But more interesting is to prove it from uh, the expansions of Riemann. So how do we do this? So we have, you will see in, in this talk, many commands of this form, something to something. So we convert something to something else. So we are expanding the Riemann into partial derivatives of Christoffel's minus products of these. And here we find a curious problem, the problem of introducing a dummy index which wasn't there before. So this is problematic because we want to avoid index collisions, the, the, the use of the same index again as a dummy or as a dummy as a, and as a free index in two different situations. So, so what we do is that we use these unique variables of, of the Wolfram language and with, which have a name, but they are very difficult to read. So each time I evaluate this, the, the number will change. So there is no danger of, of using them twice. So um, they work perfectly. So I can do the same thing with the uh, opposite configuration and as to canonical to report a zero. But how do we hide these ugly indices? So there's a function called screen dollar indices, it does that. So for example, this is, if you use that function at the end, this is how the expression looks. It has changed the, this ugly L dollar. L is because it was the least, the last in the list of indices we defined. It has been changed by E. So what we will do, we do this, this is a function of, of the Wolfram language. So we do this. Most users do this at the very beginning of every session in exact. And from now on, we will not see those dollar indices again. They are still there, that's important, because otherwise we would still risk collisions of indices, but we will not see them. They will be always replaced by nice indices which are not being used already in the expression. Okay, is that clear? Any question, everything going well? Let's talk about Christoffels. This is one of the things that exact does different than the standard uh, textbooks. The problem is that in textbooks, we see these Christoffels are not tensors. They do not change as tensors do under changes of coordinates. For exact, this is acceptable because not being something is not very well defined. So we need to have a proper geometric character for things. So in exact, everything will be a tensor. We just have to find how to reinterpret it as a tensor. And the way we do this for Christoffels is by treating them as differences of connections. So where is the other one? So here we follow Walt again. So Walt in his book introduces the concept of ordinary derivative. This is a very interesting concept, which allows us to use partial derivatives as covariant derivatives, as connections. So what these ordinary de derivatives are, are connections which have no curvature and no torsion. You can define um, one of them starting from a coordinate system, but because we don't want to introduce a coordinate system, we will just assume that this a single but fully general, no restriction whatsoever on that coordinate system. So that will be our approach in, in exact to work with partial derivatives and this derivative is called P capital P capital D. So let's see how it works. So this is the Christoffel, this, this is the geometric optic, the Christoffel relating these two derivatives. And um, 
it's it's exactly like that one. So if you don't specify the second derivative, extensor will assume you are referring to PD. And so now this object has a well-defined meaning. And it's called Christoffel CD. It's the Christoffel of this uh, connection. If you reverse the order, of course, because these are differences, then you get the uh, the, the minus. Right? It's minus the Christoffel. Okay, so to understand this better, let's define another covariant derivative, and this time we are going to add torsion. Uh, it will be denoted in this way in prefix notation, that sorry, in postfix notation, that way in prefix notation. I, I, I don't remember why I put first post and then pre, but yeah, too late to change it. So we define again all these tensors. Now, this doesn't say that this is vanishing. And so now we have the torsion of this derivative, the Christoffel, the Riemann, the Ricci. So what does it mean that it has torsion? So it means that if we have two derivatives acting and we sort them, um, exact always likes having indices sorted in postfix notation. So this would be um, A, B, if we put them behind. So you see we have the rich here and uh, for this derivative and for the derivative with torsion, we get the same term, but now we have an additional term with torsion. So exact is trained to use torsion whenever needed, uh, connections with, uh, without deriving from a metric, it knows all these properties. So it can be used in, in, in this general situation. It can use torsion even if the, the, the derivative derives from a metric. For example, how do we change from one to another via Christoffel's? Now, look at this case. This case is not using PD, so it's going to define this Christoffel tensor that connects these two derivatives. And so this expression still has a correct geometric meaning. And so, Yep, here we convert again this one into PD. So now we have two Christoffels, and of course the, uh, this Christoffel can be broken into parts. So this is this difference of two Christoffels, and we can now simplify, and we get the original expression. So this may be a bit confusing if you haven't seen this before, but this is this, I wanted to show this as an example of the sort of trouble that exact goes to in order to keep geometric meaning in for everything. In this way, we will be able to do crazy things like, I don't know, lead derivatives of Christoffels and lead derivatives of connections, of Jacobians, and all these type of things, because it's always, everything's always well-defined tensorially. Okay, let's do something a bit more fun. Um, Yes, so this is how we are printing Christoffels. We are going to change it. We can, we can change it to anything we want, like just the gamma. And here we have a, an interesting Wolfram language construction. This is called an up value. The thing in, in Wolfram language is that every value, every assignment is attached to a symbol. And so by default, it's attached to the most external symbol. But this is a, some sort of system function. And what we want in, in exact is to attach symbols to where they belong, to the internal symbol, because this is a property of this one. And so the way we do this is with an up value. So this is telling the system that this is a value that should be attached to this symbol. If, if, you, if you don't put this, it will complain. It will complain that it cannot attach that symbol to print us because it's protected. Symbols that are general, general are protected so that you don't break inadvertently uh, something important. We do the same thing with Riemann. And now, when we print the Christoffel and the Riemann, we will just see that, which is nicer to, to read when we have only one connection. So, let's start with the covariant derivative of Riemann, and we antisymmetrize in these indices, C, D, and E, which are this one and this one too. Okay, we have that expression. We multiply by three, call to canonical, and we have now these three things. Okay, 
So our objective is to show that this is zero. How do we do that? Uh, first, we expand the covariant derivatives into Christoffels. We have now that. You see how these covariant derivatives have been converted into this type of object, partial derivatives. Partial derivative in the sense I said before, this, this PD is still a, for exact, this PD is, is a connection as much as this is. It's just a connection without torsion and without curvature. Okay, so now we want to convert the Riemann into Christoffels. So now we have this expression, in which we have, uh, yeah, more derivatives, and now we have second derivatives. And now, once we have something like this, in which everything is, is of the same type, we can go to canonical, and to canonical we'll say that this is zero. Right? So this, this is a standard cycle in exact. In general, if you want to show something, it's a lot better if you can convert it into something that should be zero. Because for to canonical, it's, it's very, to, to canonical is great when something is zero via, via, via uh, symmetries. It, it, it will find it. Okay, so I have several sections, but I'm not sure how many of you are actually uh, following. So if you are following and you are evaluating what I'm doing here, I had this exercise, which is show the second Bianchi identity with torsion, which is this expression. You have to do the same thing. It's, it's, it's exactly the same thing, but at some point you will also have to express the torsion in terms of Christoffels. Torsion is a difference of two Christoffels. So you will have to use also the torsion to Christoffel. So while you try to do that, for those of you who are following, I will have a look at questions here. I try to undefine the manifold, but I get an error. Yes, yes. So once you have defined things on a manifold, say vector fields, you cannot undefine the manifold before you undefine those tensors too. Because if you undefine the manifold, those tensors will get corrupted. I call this having visitors. So you will get messages saying, no, I cannot undefine the manifold because it has visitors. Right, so let's try. So if I do and the and def manifold M, it will say it has visitors. It's it's a funny way of saying I have defined already many things on this uh, manifold. So let's have a look. All these things are defined on the on the manifold. So you can you have to undefine them all before, and once this list is empty, then you can undefine the manifold. This is a safety feature. Other questions? For the dummy indices, the indices are searched from the indices to define when manifold M was undefined. What happens when you run out of indices? Yes. So when we define the indices, we used something like the list A, B, I don't know, up to L. So when exact needs more indices, it will create indices L1, L2, L3, etc. As many as needed. And sometimes with big expressions, you will you will see sometimes an, an L13 index. So we never run out of indices. So to canonical is checking that every term in the linear expression is zero? No. No, to canonical is converting every term into a canonical form. And then Mathematica itself realizes that two terms are equal and, and, and subtract them and give zero if they are zero. Or if two terms are identical and, and there is an addition, it will give twice that term. But to canonical doesn't know anything about sums. To canonical is all about canonicalization of tensor products. No, no matter how many indices the tensor product has. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Not sure whether you have time to do this. Let's do this. So we have this expression, which is the same as before, but with this torsion term. And now with exact, I can click here. I have the solution. These will evaluate everything. It, it, it's exactly the same steps as before, but with this additional one, torsion to Christopher. And so we will get 
this big expression with, you see, these are the torsion terms, the differences of Christoffel's with anti-symmetrized indices here, and then at the end, give zero. I, I have exactly here the same thing for the first Bianchi identity, which is uh, a little big initially, a little bit bigger in, initially, but uh, then the same, very same commands will also give you zero eventually. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to undefine this covariant derivative, which I will not need anymore. Okay, so now you know everything about uh, covariant derivatives, or at least those that do not derive from a metric. Any question here? As I said, feel free to use voice if you want. Okay, so now let's go to metric fields, what we nearly always need in, in TR. Um, so metric is just a standard symmetric to covariant tensor field, but exact treaties, treats it in three special ways. First, we will have its Levit-Civita connection, which is the connection that gives zero on the metric. And then the curvature tensors associated to the Levit-Civita connection will have additional properties. We will use the metric to raise and lower indices. This is probably the most important thing of the metric. And then another object that will be associated to it is the volume form, which, I mean, because a tensor doesn't have uh, differential forms, it will be an antisymmetric tensor. Okay, so here, with this command, we define the metric. That's our metric, as I said, because we used G as an index, we cannot use it again. So we will say, print the metric as G, even though we will have to always use uh, MET internally. This is the name of the Levitsevita connection, and this is the sign of the determinant of the metric, which is the only thing we need here. For Because sometimes we will need the, for variational purposes, we will need the, the square root of the determinant of the metric. So we need to know whether it is the square root of the determinant of the or the square root of the minus the determinant. So that's it. Uh, that's the main role of this minus one. Okay, so we define the metric. Many tensors are defined here again. That's the volume form with four indices because we are in dimension four. There's this thing called tetra, which is used for spinors. Let's forget about it. The Levitsevita connection, the vanishing torsion, the, the Christoffel CD, which is now symmetric in the last two indices. The Riemann tensor, and notice that now it's defined with four indices down so that we can implement its full symmetries. The Ricci, which is symmetric. The Ricci scalar now, because of course we have a metric to control the Ricci scalar. And we also define the Einstein tensor and other things like the Weyl tensor, the trace-free Ricci, the Kretschmann scalar, and there are others that are defined in other packages. I think extras defines the shout and tensors, and others could be defined. Okay, also the determinant, and it's a, a weight of, uh, a density of weight plus two. We will talk about the density later. So that's the metric, and notice how it's represented as G, even though internally it's still met. It's just typesetting. Mathematica is so flexible in, in typesetting. So that's the inverse metric of course, and if we contract the metric with the inverse metric, we get the delta. The covariant derivative, the covariant, uh, so the Levitsevita connection gives zero on the metric and, of, and on its inverse. But other derivatives, for example, remember PD do not give zero, of course, or this other connection that we defined with torsion does not give zero, so it stays there. Okay, so let's talk about raising and lowering indices. This is another thing that it's not automatic because again, there are computations in which you want all the metric factors explicit. 
for example, you are going to do variational derivatives and things like that. So, um, or are, there are computations in which you want to be very careful on, on whether indices stay up or down. So there is a, a special function called contract metric to perform these contractions. Um, if we have um, a metric and its Levitsky-Vita connection, that's CD, we are using NABLA for CD, then contract metric knows that it can go through it, let's say, and, and, and this. So for other cases, for example, let's, let's suppose we want to do this. Now, because the, uh, the partial derivative of the metric is not zero, we cannot just lower the index. The index. So this will just not work. And if you want to force it, there is this option. The, this is also another thing in, in Bolfram language. The behavior of commands can be modified by optional arguments, which are these rules. Right? And so now we say the default of, of over derivatives is false, but with this syntax, we indicate that we want to override that, and now it will go inside, it will lower the index, but of course it will be forced to produce a new term. So you decide whether you want that or, or not. Here's another question. When defining the metric in this way, we are assuming GR symmetries, right? Can we allow torsion? Yes, yes. Uh, if we go back here, and here you say torsion goes to true, then the Levitivita, the, the derivative will be still be associated to the metric in the sense of given zero, but it will be a connection with torsion. And exact will know immediately all the rules for Riemanns, etc., that relate to, to torsion. So yes, you can have the situation of having a metric and having torsion. I think we finished here. Yep. So, so now that we have a metric, we the, the Riemann will have full symmetry, right? And um, yes, so this is our Riemann, the Riemann of Nabla, remember? And now we can check the symmetry on the second pair of arguments, uh, of, of indices, sorry. We do the same thing as always. We just convert the Riemann to uh, derivatives of Christoffels. And here we have now a new object. We can convert the Christoffels to derivatives of the metric. So we have that thing. Here you see these indices we are we were discussing before, L5, L4, etc. No problem whatsoever. Again, to canonical, we'll realize that that's zero. Okay? So we have proved the uh, anti-symmetry in the second pair. So for example, I have here as, as an exercise to prove that Riemann is symmetric under exchange of the two pairs of indices. Give you a few seconds. Any any other question in the meantime? Why grad metric? <laughs> um, I don't know. How would you call it? Um, it, it, it was a random decision. It's just derivative of the metric. I mean. It, it can be used with any. It, it can be used with any covariant derivative. It doesn't have to be PD necessarily. So, I didn't want to use a PD here. But there are alias. Um, there are aliases. So, so there are commands in Exact that have several names. It's a very very same function, but it doesn't happen often. But I don't know. Perhaps ten times, there are commands. Uh, to have several names because in, in different situations a different name feels nicer. Um, okay, so let's go here and this always in the middle. So we have to start with um, yeah the, the, the expression we want to show it's zero 
and then we apply, we convert the Riemann to Christoffels, the Christoffels to derivatives of the metric, then apply it to canonical. So that, uh, that's the expression we get here, and we get zero. Okay. And um, the final slide on metric related things. So, yeah, as I said before, contractions of Riemann give reaching and contractions of uh, Ricci, in this case it's, it's automatic, give uh, the Ricci scale. So we can expand Riemann into vial, which is this W tensor. And for example, we can go back from Riemann, from vial to Riemann, right? So, so now if we do to canonical, it would sort out the indices and give the Riemann back. We can change from Ricci to Einstein That's the Einstein tensor, and um, or we can change Ricci to a trace-free Ricci, which is called S in exact. So that's the trace-free Ricci tensor. And then we have the volume form, the volume antisymmetric tensor. So it's epsilon of G. Again, G is the name of the metric, so it has to be there because it, it's, each metric will have its own volume form. It's a tensor that gives zero under the covariant derivative, under the Levitch Vita. It, this is a tensor. This is not the density that gives minus ones and plus ones. So if, if we had these in some frame, it would, it, the values would be square roots of the terminal of the metric. But in, in a tensor, we don't have charts, so we cannot do that. Um, yeah, if we multiply two epsilons, we get determinant type of expressions. So those are all three indices. Here we contract the last ones, so we get fewer, and, and here we contract two of them, three of them, all of them. And then there is the determinant of the metric. The determinant of the metric is this funny object, which is a density of weight plus one. That's indicated with this double twiddle here. And um, I don't know where I took this notation. I think it comes from Ashtekar, if, if I'm not mistaken, of, of denoting densities by, by number of, of tildes. But, <laughs> These objects shouldn't exist really in, in exact, uh, sorry, in extensor. It, it's an object that lives properly in Excova with, with frames. So we will talk about densities there. For example, how to work with two metrics. This happens, imagine that you are working with conformal theories and you have two metrics. So the, here is, I, I said at the beginning that exact keeps track of everything except for metrics. Here is where these appears, and you have to be super careful with that. So what we will do is that even though, for example, when we had many covariant derivatives, they were all treated equally. There was none which was more important than the others. But with metrics, the first one will be more important, and that's the only one that we allow to raise and lower indices. The other ones are what we call frozen, that, that just exact terminology. Right? So the metrics are either the first or they are frozen. So let's define another metric and immediately you get a warning saying that there are already other metrics. So this one is going to be frozen. This means that raising the indices of this metric is not it, its inverse because raising the indices is done with the other metric. So it's not the inverse of this anymore. So the inverse will be denoted like that, and it has upper indices. Right? We can define the epsilon, again, torch, uh, vanishing torsion, etc. Right? In another, imp well, we will discuss it later. So now these two give the delta, right? But not this. These two do not give the delta, because this guy it's not this guy. If, if we separate the metrics, 
factors are explicit, you see that the, these two indices are raised with the first metric. So this is done because if we don't do this, suddenly all raising and lowering indices, we would have to remember which, with which metric it was raised and lowered. And then the notation would become so much more complicated. So this was a case in which I decided it wasn't worth it. So it's rare the situation in which you work with several metrics, but but in exact you have to be uh, allowed to do it. So something similar happens with the Riemann. So Riemann here means you are lowering the index uh, with the metric, and that was uh, the. Yes, that was the, the, the other metric. But you see, if you lower the metric, the index, so let me start again. So this is the full Riemann, right? So the correct Riemann is the Riemann that has this index up. If you lower the index with the first metric, you get that. But that may be not your, what you are thinking of. You want to raise, to lower, sorry, the index with its own metric. Then you get a different tensor. Which, which it's called Riemann down CD. And this is the one that has full symmetries. This pair is symmetric with this pair, etc. This one is not. And an exact knows that. Okay, so let's, for example, let us suppose that we want to do things with a conformal metric. So the, this is the conformal factor. And we are going to use rules to change from this metric to that metric. So this is expression the relation between that metric and that metric. Notice how we don't care about whether the indices are upper or and lower because both metrics will be using the same metric to raise and lower them. That, that's why this is important. The inverse metric will have this other relation, but now, of course, the conformal factor is dividing, not multiplying. Okay, so those are the rules. So, let's let's check some relations. So, for example, what's the difference between the two Christoffels? You see, remember, this is lowercase is the original metric, the first metric, the the lowercase met, and this is the new metric, the frozen metric, uh, uppercase met. So we have that thing, right? This is the Lebesgue-Vita connection of the first metric. This is the um, Lebesgue-Vita connection of the frozen metric. We convert Christoffel to grad matrix. Of course, it will use the corresponding matrix in each form. And here, you see it, it's careful of using I for the inverse matrix. This is the inverse matrix of this matrix. Now we can replace our conformal rules. And here we see. Right? And of course, as usual, to canonical, we'll do it same. And I, I'm using again an option because I want to control raising and lowering indices, because we are using here metrics that do not, uh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's useful to, to uh, if we don't use this, exact will immediately start telling you messages, oh, I'm finding derivatives which do not commute with the metric, and it will become uh, nervous. It will eventually give you the same result, but it will take a lot longer, because it will do more checks. So let's try to do something more difficult, which is the relation between the wide tensors for conformal metrics. So, and here, rather than just putting here what I know is the result, I'm going to try to find it. So, so this is more like an explorative uh, example, a technique of how do you look for new identities. So let's define a tensor called X, which is what we are looking for. And we put it there. So we know that there is a relation there, some scalar, but we don't know what it is. So our objective is to find X. Well, we do exactly the same things we always do. We convert by to Riemann, and notice how it's using this curly R, meaning it's the Riemann down, not the proper Riemann. So we have to start by transforming Riemann down to Riemann, so that we have only Riemanns. That's this thing, you see? That thing was converted into that thing. And now we have the proper Riemann. Now we convert the Riemanns into derivatives of Christoffels. We have these things. 
Now, a new object appears in Excite, which is an important object. This thing here is called scalar. You can have something like, uh, sorry, uh, let's put, that's too simple. Uh, let's see, um, Richie City minus A minus B, G City baby. So this means, th this scalar is a way of scoping indices. These indices are blocked by this scalar construct. So if I put them now here, minus A minus B, there is no problem, sorry. <laughs> See, these indices are different from those indices. Exact knows that these indices do not escape the scalar construct. Right? So when you have huge expressions containing very large scalars, it's worth wrapping them in scalar because that will help a lot in the, in the, in the computation. You, you simplify the, the number of indices exact has to worry about. And so some of the computations are prepared to help in that way. So the way to avoid that is to use no scalar. Let me start again. No scalar will replace that by normal dummy indices. Now we can continue. We convert Christoffels, which we still have, into derivatives of the metric. And now we have an expression that only has metrics and derivatives. Some metrics are the conformal metric, some metrics are the background metric, tons of them. So we now do this. We use our conformal rules and we expand the expression. So this is an expression with around 900 terms. To canonical, can bring that into 176. Right? And finally, we can just simplify to try to group them. And as I said, simplify is a very difficult operation, so it may take time for long expressions. In this case, it's it can do it in a few seconds, so it's fine. And you see here it has found this term here, so we know the answer. X is phi squared. And we just don't care about the the rest of the expression. So sometimes the, the work of simplify is so incredibly large. I mean, imagine that instead of having a thousand terms, you had a hundred thousand terms. This might take hours. So what you can do is to identify some terms that will give you the answer. So for example, imagine that you are looking for second derivatives of the metric. You can do that. These cases is a mathematical command that extracts the uh, the, the all terms that have second derivatives of the metric. These blanks are patterns, so it doesn't matter what is there. And remember, this is just function application. It's just that for derivatives, I like putting them in this way. And this means this is a default. If, if there was a term, if uh, not multiplying anything, this would, this, this would also match. This is just general pattern, matter, pattern matching language of, 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 of mathematics. Okay, but again, this is just a way of extracting some terms you are interested in, the second derivatives. Does exact let us count terms in these expressions? Count terms in these expressions. Well, you can always use length, because remember that in Mathematica, everything is an expression, so you can use length in absolutely everything. So, so this expression, is a plus expression. The head of this, if we used, if we looked at the internal form of this, it would be plus, head plus, with first argument, this one, second argument, that one, third argument, that one, etc. If we want to count terms, we just do that. Right? Again, the, the fact that everything is an expression is so very useful, because functions that work on general expressions work absolutely everywhere in the system. Okay, uh, just three lines on lead derivatives, you can do lead derivatives. And this is a case in which we have indices that are, even though they are alone, they actually do not matter. 
It doesn't matter whether I put an A or a B there. Right? It's the same expression. And of course, if I have an A here, these two indices are completely separate. No problem. These, so these are the three indices of the. Right? So there is a command. I don't have it here, but indices of. Mm, so I think I have to say this. Right. And here, here, this expression will report the indices of 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 an expression. And here you can put things like free, dummy, upper, lower. So the just specify here the types of indices you are interested in. And so there are tons and tons of utilities in exact to manipulate indices. So um, yeah, this is one of them. Again, um, in general, with Li derivatives, what you want to do is to convert them to some covariant derivative. That would be it. And if we contract the metric, because this is the levi civita connection, we get the standard uh, symmetrized gradient of, of, of vectors. OK. There are also Li brackets, if you want, but I will not go into them. And one of the final things I want to show about exact, sorry, about extensor, is variational derivatives, which are important in GR. So I'm going to use always to canonical with this option here, again, to simplify the computations by avoiding indices moving up and down. And um, this is this is general from language. You can set options uh, permanently in this way. So from now on, once I have evaluated this, to canonical will always use this value until I set the value back with set options again. See, these are other options you can choose with um, with to canonical. For example, if you want to see to canonical in action, turn variables to true, and you will get uh, messages reporting what to canonical is doing. You, you get an idea of what it's happening internally. Okay, so let's, I want to do the GR case, but before, just so that it's simpler to understand, let's do Maxwell's case. So we define the Maxwell tensor. It's called, it's going to be called Maxwell A. This is the potential, the vector potential. I define it with our index. And it's going to be printed like A, as A. And this is the F tensor, the, the <coughs> Uh, anti-symmetrized derivatives of of, uh, of A. And uh, notice that I don't have to define it with def tensor because this object is never going to exist in, in index computations. I'm just defining a function that constructs this, this thing. Right? So whenever I call Maxwell F, it will be converted into this. So we will never see a capital F, A, B, or anything like that. So let's do that, and you see how I'm using Maxwell F here. So that's the Lagrangian, right? So it's the product and then contraction. And let's define this SDG object, which is the square root of minus the metric, the determinant of the metric. So we have var d. This is variational derivatives in extensor. So we are going to differentiate with respect to Maxwell A and um, SDG, Lagrangian, SDG. So we are introducing this thing here, and then dividing, and calling to canonical. So that's the thing that we get back. This is not very recognizable, but if we take Maxwell and do a uh, divergence, so we take a covariant derivative and then contract uh, index B with index C, and then this is the same type of thing again. We change the, the um, covariant derivatives to Christoffel, the Christoffels to derivatives of the metric, and to canonical. We get that expression, which is, of course, the same. So we see that what we got here was that thing. And now I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but for the metric. For, sorry, for, for this rich scalar instead of the electromagnetic Lagrangian. And um, so I'm construct, I'm expanding the rich scalar into derivatives of the metric. 
And now I'm doing the same operation as before. It's just that instead of differentiating with respect to um, respect to potential, now it's symmetric. Now this this takes um, about 10 seconds because it goes through um, several hundred terms internally. But the good news is that later in the talk, we'll see a much better way of computing this with uh, using other packages. So that's what we get back. And again, we have to check that that's the Einstein tensor. We expand the Einstein tensor into derivatives of the metric, and we check that the two results are the same. And we turn the option to canonical back. Okay, um, yes, so I'm, we are going to break now that uh, this is the last slide about the um, extensor, and after this slide, we will have a five minutes break. Um, yes, there are many other things extensor can do, and I don't have time to explain them. It can work with complex vector bundles. And so these are the inner uh, vector bundles where you can define gauge symmetries and things like that. I, I'm not even going to, well, let, let's evaluate this very quickly. So this is an, an inner bundle, vector bundle, it's complex, so it will define its complex conjugate. This dagger means the uh, complex conjugate in exact. We can define connections that uh, work on these inner bundles. And now we can define tensors that have indices in the tangent bundle and the inner bundle. Yes, these are mixed things. And so notice how, for example, this connection now still has a Christoffel, but this Christoffel has these indices. This is, this is called A because it's like the vector potential in electromagnetism. It's just that in electromagnetism, the gauge um, vector bundle is one dimensional. So we don't bother to, to add the indices there. So we just have one index. The same thing happens with the curvature, right? It's still like four indices object, but we just keep these two, the F, mu, and U. These two are one dimensional. Okay, so now if we perform covariant derivatives of these things, now we get two terms, the Christoffel of the B index and the Christoffel, in quotes, of the inner index, which you can change back. And another thing, this is the last thing I think I have, is induced matrix. You can define a time-like vector this is a way of telling Mathematica that its norm is minus one. Right? So if you contract it with itself, it's minus one. And now you can say, oh, I have a metric that is induced from some other metric along this time-like unit vector. It's going to be printed as H. And now this thing, it's complaining that you already have two other metrics, of course. This thing is going to define things like the extrinsic curvature, the acceleration vector, projection along the metric, etc. So that's the K tensor, which we can convert into derivatives of N, etc. So we have the Kodachi, the Gauss Kodachi equations, etc. etc. So you, you, you can work with all these things here. There are other things like yeah, right. So yeah, so there are right now nearly 500 commands in, in, ex, in extensor. Okay, and here we now look at how many things we have defined and undo them. First, we start with the matrix. Then, and now, now we have less tensors. We, de, we undefine the covariant derivatives. Now we have less, less tensors. These are the ones we defined by hand. So we undefined all of them. This complains because this one already removed that one. And finally, we undefined the inner bundle. And the only thing we are left is the manifold M. Okay, and the laps and shift functions there. Those are not there yet. No, those you have to define by yourself. 
Okay, so let's do uh, a five minute break. So it's 36. Let's start. Let's restart at 41. Um, ready to continue. I think I'm going to skip this slide. This slide that explains a bit how the internal group theory algorithms work. It is rather technical. It's about double cosets. Um, yeah, if, if you have questions, just contact me separately. Okay, um, so what we saw was extensor, which is the main package of the system and the most important one. Everything else in the system uses extensor and that's, that was the biggest section. So now we will look at component computations, the ones in which we have a frame or a chart and it's associated coordinate or not frame and um, we'll see. So we have installed extensor, now we load Excova. Because we already had extensor, it's not reported. If I had started from scratch, this would report the loading of extensor too and the other packages. So, the first thing here is to define a frame or a basis. I will use these two words, in, um, meaning exactly the same thing. And, um, and the, the frame or the basis is defined on the bundle. So, we have to specify the numbers we are going to give to those uh, vectors. They can be any numbers. They, they must be integers, but they can be negative numbers. Right? Imagine that you are working with harmonics and you want vectors minus one, zero, one, or something like that. Now the other thing, interesting, the other interesting thing, as I mentioned before, is that in, Ex in Excova, bases, frames have a color. So you have to choose a color. By default, it will be red. So if you use two, it's good to change the color because otherwise they will both look red. So I'm going to use the name of the of the frame as the color. Associated to each frame, there is a derivative, which I call the parallel derivative. And it's a derivative defined so that it gives zero on the vector fields of the frame. So sometimes we work with the structure constants, the commutators of the vector fields of a frame. So in this language, those commutators become the torsion. And when the, the basis is coordinated, when the frame is coordinated, this derivative is torsionless. It becomes an ordinary derivative. This derivative, the derivative associated to a frame, is, is always a zero curvature, always zero Riemann. But it may have torsion or not, depending on whether the, the frame is coordinated or not. Okay, and now once we have distortion, we have all the tensors, so sorry, once we have this connection, we have all these uh, things associated. And here finally, in the frame, with the frame, we have also two more fields, which are the densities, plus one and minus one, eta, the eta uh, up and eta down. These are the objects which have components in this frame, minus zero, one, or minus one. And they are two different. Right? Okay, uh, and then the other frame, exactly the same thing. We have PD blue now. That's another derivative, uh, etc. And and I will use the same number: zero, one, two, three. These are frames. We have not defined a chart yet. There is no, there are no coordinates here. They are just vector fields. So now this is the key object to work with components. It's called C tensor from component tensor. And it plays in Excova with component computations the same role that symbols play in sorry, in extensor. Is wrong. The main syntax is this one. C tensor takes the array of components, the basis in which we are uh, giving these components, and then a weight. And again, we will talk about the weights a bit later. So let's start with this. This is a vector field 
it's 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 a contravariant vector field because this is this doesn't have a minus. If this had a minus, then this would be a covariant vector field. This is a contravariant vector field, and this means uh, this is a vector field which in these in the vector fields of this frame has component ten minus twenty three one six. If you give it an index, like in extensor, looks like that. It looks very small. Sorry about that. So, so now we can multiply that with itself. That's a pity that it's so small. Can I, um, it will be probably too large. Okay, well, I'm going to try to do this because otherwise probably you are not going to see these numbers. But, but now that the font is a bit too large. Okay, so the input form is a C tensor, again, and you see zero is added. The weight is added automatically. So in output, all the C tensors have a weight, zero. And this is what we were saying before, because both the first index, which is vertical, and the second index, which is horizontal, are expressed in the same basis, the, the red basis. We see these two lines red and these two lines red. We will say later mixed cases. So if we do um, this product now three times, we have an object of three indices. And now, of course, we have first index, second index, and the third index runs inside. There is this, this uh, function, head of tensor, that extracts the C tensor from a tensor. So just say, it's, this is like remove the indices. It has a yeah. The, the name is is not very fortunate, but that's how it's called. So now let's introduce another vector in the blue basis. And now let's multiply u and w. Now you you have that object, right? So now we see. I chose this so that we distinguish well the blue direction. The blue direction is the one in which things are repeated, right? The first index a u is the blue direction, and the other one is the red direction. So again, in the same way that you could have as many covariant derivatives as you wanted, and etc., you can have as many frames as you want in the same uh, vector bundle. And now, the, this will be a C tensor with these components, and now the first base is blue, the second is red. It's still zero weight. So that's, that's C tensor. We will look at, at a bit of algebra first, and then we will look at differentiation. So here comes the idea, the key idea to connect Excova and extensor. So we take again our vector, WA. You know, the, the, I think the, the slide show is changing the sizes. So this looks, this looks a bit ugly. Should be the vector should be bigger, the index should be smaller. Let's continue that way. So basis expand is a command that will convert this object into a linear combination of the actual vectors. So the, you can manipulate these as if they were tensors. And now we see, again, because we are still in the red basis, we have to keep their redness, right? As long as, remember, as long as things have colors, they are basis dependent. So we look at them. So now we, he, we see these basis objects. And here we have something, again, very important. This is what I call basis indices. In some books, I remember a book called Tensor Geometry by Dobstone and Poston. They call them marked indices. And the idea is that if together with the number you keep track of the basis, then this object is essentially abstract again, right? Because you can always re reconstruct the abstract object, right? So these indices are still abstract. These indices are uh, basis indices. And they denote, uh, yeah, the, the position in the basis. So these objects, even though they have two indices, they, they are actually vectors, right? Because this is not a true abstract index. You can go back, and from this expression, using from base expand, you get back the C tensor. Okay, so 
this is the object, basis is the object that performs the connection between working with uh, yeah, Excova and with Extensor. Now, what is this basis? Formally, turns out it is exactly like delta. So, for example, this is the co contravariant vector field number zero. This is the covariant vector field number one. And in, in some books, they, they two things that, these two things are put vertically, which in most cases is fine. But if you go to spinors, in which the metric is antisymmetric, moving these things horizontally changes the sign. So, so we have to be super careful with that. And that's why exact doesn't put these things vertically and, and keeps the order. In this way, we can use the whole framework, the, same, the very, very same framework in spinors. Um, right, so if we, cont if we have two of these objects, they are, for the same reason as with the metric, we do it manually. We say contract basis. And now, of course, this vector field, uh, this one, is orthogonal to this covariant vector field, which belongs to the same basis. Okay, and, and the same one gives one, of course. And you see, basis, as I said, is actually another name for delta. It's exactly the same thing. They, they actually interconvert into each other. If you put two abstract indices to get delta, and if you put a basis index in delta, you get basis. So basis and delta are two names of the same tensor. And an another way of showing the connection. And actually, if we were super strict, we could even generalize this to the metric and say that the metric can have the three shapes, basis, delta, when the indices are, are of different character, and the metric when the indices are horizontal in either up or down. But we prefer to keep the three different things. Okay, so now, how we do, let's define a tensor, right? An, an abstract tensor. And this is the sort of thing I was saying before. With SCOBA, you have still all the power of, of extensor in your hands. So now, let's do this thing. So this tensor, abstract tensor, is contracted with two vec with two covectors. So it's going to give a scalar. This thing is a scalar, which we call the scalar T12. And it's a scalar, of course, in the basis red. So we, we need to keep the redness. And it's represented like that. Um, there are functions to construct all the components. For example, let's go back to our vector, right? So this was our vector uh, with these components. We can extract the one red, which is directly minus 23, right? Remember, this was 0, 1, 2, 3. So there, there was a question. For basis vectors and index, and just um, I there is a question from Mam Mam Vendra, and I don't understand. Can we define an orthonormal basis? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, the, the, the basis by default have have no orthonormality properties. It it's just that. The basis with respect to the the covariant basis, they are they are dual dual of each other. This is not about metrics. They are, this is duality. So um, this is exactly this thing is this contraction, right? So, so you see how this works. In the same way that with the delta, we just if this index is repeated, we just replace that one. With basis, we do the same thing because basis is delta. So if this index is repeated, we put that thing there. But because this is red and this vector is red, we can extract the component one, which is minus 23. Now, what happens if we have a different basis like this? We have a vector expressed in the basis A, sorry, in the, in the basis red, and we contract with the blue, with the first vector of the blue basis. 
we contract basis, and now we get these things. We get a linear combination of scalars, these are scalars, and these are scalars of the matrix, these are the entries of the matrix of basis of change, of change of basis, sorry. These are the scalars of the entries of the change of basis matrix. So that's what we need to do now, to specify that matrix. So let's construct some random matrix. Let's check that it is not singular. Right? So every time I evaluate this, I get a different one. Doesn't matter. As long as it is not zero, it's fine. And um, we said, so this object is going to be playing the role of uh, of the matrix of change of basis. And now again, Xcoba is is as noisy as X extensor is. It, it reports the values it's adding for the inverse direction and the, di and the direct direction. Yeah, all these rules. And it's also comp it also computes the Jacobian. There's a Jacobian of the transformation. And here we see now, well, we will talk more about it later, but Jacobians are things that have weights plus one and minus one in different bases. So we will tilde. We color the tildes. You will see the usefulness of this later. Okay, so now let's go back. That's our vector. That's the red component. That's the blue component. And now because we have added numbers, we can compute that. So, for example, we can start with the blue, with, with W, right? Remember that W was the, the, the C tensor in the red basis. Now, to, with 2C tensor, we can uh, tell any tensor there, with however many indices we have, to convert it into the other basis. And we can change back, WB. Right? Remember that this is the same vector all the time. It's just expressed in different bases. So this is, in a sense, this is abstract, because it remembers simultaneously the numbers and the bases. Okay, so, yes, so compute the tensor product of W with itself and express in the four possible basis configurations, namely red, 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 blue, blue, red, and blue, blue. So for those of you who are following, uh, try to do that. Any other question in the meantime? Right, so you see how with the colors we can write, we can read uh, red, 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 blue, blue, red, blue, blue. Okay, so the way to do that would be just we compute first the tensor product, we extract the C tensor, remember this funny word, and now we just put the original one, which is red, red, and change to red, blue, change to blue, red, change to blue, blue. So that's the original, that's what we extract with that command, and this final list of four elements gives these four arrays. Now something interesting is that, of course, because W and W are the same vector, WW is a symmetric tensor, right? So we see here how this is symmetric. However, when you change bases, a symmetric tensor may not look symmetric if the bases are different. This is something to be aware of, right? So Symmetry is only explicit if you are using all indices with the same basis. Because symmetry is so important in, in exact, this type of thing always plays a role. Okay. Densities. So this is another, in the same way that Christoffels are treated differently in exact, densities is again one of these not tensor that do not fit well here. So we need to find a way of interpreting things as tensors. So what, what is density? <clears throat> so the density is just something that depends on the basis, but 
via Jacobians. Rather than via a full multiplication by the change of basis, just the Jacobian that is being multiplied. So what we will do is <coughs> storing these densities using the names of the bases. So let's let's do this here. So let's take this matrix, this tensor, which is two covariant, and um, let's compute uh, a determinant. Right, so the determinant is actually a basis-dependent concept because in order to compute a determinant, you first need to project the tensor into a given basis and then you compute the determinant of those components. So determinants should keep somehow the uh, basis they were, they were used to be computed. So if we compute the determinant of that guy, we get that thing. And if we put, it's a scalar, right? Because it has no, no basis here. And you see, this is the weight. Not only we say it's it's weight two, we remember in which basis it is base two. It's the red basis. So we will represent it like this. And because it's plus, we put the two tildes on top. So that's a that's a the density. So for example, we have the determinant of city blue. It, Remember, it was the very same tensor. It just expressed in a different basis. So we have that. Now we put braces. Again, it's a two, but it's it's two. It's plus two in the basis blue. So now we compute the Jacobian. What's the Jacobian? The Jacobian is the determinant of the basis <coughs> of, of change of, of the matrix of change of basis. So, and Jacobians have tilde of one color and tilde of another color. And one is up, the other is down. So we represent that like this. How is this useful? Well, how do we relate that with that? <clears throat> so we know the two determinants, the determinant and the other determinant. Obviously, if we have this upper blue, how do you remember whether you have to divide or multiply by the Jacobian? Well, you just compare the colors, right? So this is two upper blue. We have to multiply twice by these so that these two compensate with these two from here and we are left with the two reds. So that's what we do here. And we get the same number, right? as expected. So this is how Excova deals with densities by keeping linear combinations of names of, of bases here. Yeah? And then, for example, all the derivatives, how to know how to deal with this. They will just be adding appropriate terms, depend, which depend on the basis. So every, everything is, is under control again. This may seem a bit weird, but this is how Excova works with respect to densities. Okay. So that was about frames. Again, I could go into m much more detail with respect to torsions and um, non-coordinate bases, etc. But but it gets too complicated, so um, I prefer to to explain other basic things. So yeah, any other question with re in relation to bases before we go to charts? Okay, so we are going to introduce a chart, a Cartesian chart, and now we do effectively the same thing we do for bases. Now the, the, we use the manifold, the name of the manifold rather than the name of the bundle, and we, we have to still number the vectors, the associated coordinate vectors, and we give names to the scalars. Now here there is another weird thing. The scalars are scalar fields. So they are scalar fields, meaning they need a pair of brackets. In exact, you always need a pair of brackets if something is a tensor field, no matter how many indices it has. And again, we need a color. So we do that. So we are defining the, the coordinate scalars. 
there is something related to tangent mappings, which I'm not going to go into today. We define a basis with the very same name. This is probably the only exception. Basis and charts can share names. And that means the coordinated basis of the chart. There is a um, an associated parallel derivative, etc. All the things related to a to a, to a basis. So now we have the coordinated vectors again, and remember the thing with these parallel derivatives is that they always give zero on the basis vectors, both the covariant and the contravariant vectors. This is the PD, in retrospect, the PD of, of, of extensor, the one we were looking at, was just one of these, one of these parallel derivatives with respect to a chart. It's just that we, in, in exact, in extensor, sorry, we don't allow specification of which chart you are using. It's just some sort of um, undefined, but general chart. It's a bit of Excova making its way into into ex extensor in advance. Okay, so now we can define a scalar functions. A scalar functions are functions of scalars. Functions, you have to distinguish fields from functions. Functions take scalar arguments in different arguments, while fields take indices, right? For example, this f is a function of the scalar field. So this whole thing is a field itself, but the field nature comes from these brackets. This is just a functional bracket of four arguments, a function of four arguments, right? So I, I will always use the, the words field and function carefully because of that. And now we can differentiate, for example, right? We can use the covariant derivatives on these objects because these objects is a field. We just have to take partial derivatives. This is the true partial derivative of Mathematica. And then we differentiate the fields. And the derivatives of fields, of the scalar fields, are, of course, the coordinate vectors. Right? This is what is called sometimes dt, so sorry, this would be dt, dx, dy, dz. What are the lower and top dots in some of the index appearing in the definition? Lower and top dots. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, oh, oh I see, here, like here, for example, yes. This is a technique in Wolfram language called formal symbols. So the problem is that you have A, right? So A, or let's call it, let's say X. So X is a symbol to which you can attach things. But sometimes we want symbols that are protected against the user assigning values because they are inside functions or something like that. Then we use what we call formal symbols. So that's a formal X. You see, we have all of them, all letters even Greek letters and capitals in our case. And that's that thing. The advantage of this is that you can define a function of this guy, the same as, as any other symbol. And, but, if you try to assign a, a value, they will complain. So these are protected against assignment. So you cannot break a function just by randomly assigning a value to a symbol that was used, assuming a symbol, sorry, a value would not be assigned. Yes. Okay, so that's all. So, do, so now we have a chart with, uh, yeah, with these scalar fields. So let's do a sparse, right? As usual, our preferred example. So we are going to define a chart with, uh, which is go going to be called like this the manifold M, which is four-dimensional. Uh, we are going to use numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and we are going to use these ones, these scalar fields. And notice like, like this, this option, 
we are changing the typesetting with this. We are going to use the more standard typesetting. You will see in a moment. Uh, right. So now that we have a chart, we can define a metric. So in exact, everything has to have a many. So even constants need to be defined. So this, this is a safety feature that now I consider a bit too heavy, but yeah, this is what I did years ago. So the mass, again, can have any name. It will print as capital M. And so this is going to be now our metric. It's a C tensor. We give a diagonal matrix with these components in the sparse field uh, chart, a basis, a coordinated basis. And that this is how it looks, right? It's brown, they remember. This this frame, this basis was brown. And we have those components. So that's symmetric. If we want to show it expanded, we have that. And, and here you see, I've changed. Instead of having the E's, I have these uh, these objects. They are not colored. They could be colored. They could be browned, brown. But because they have the names of the scalars, I thought this is safe enough to realize that this is chart dependent. Because you see, they actually. Right? But strictly, I could color these things brown. Okay, uh, now I said this is the metric, but does, does it mean I can already lower and raise indices? The answer is not yet. I haven't, I just have a tensor, right, that I called the metric. I haven't told the system, use this tensor to raise and lower indices. So this doesn't work. I can, of course, compute the inverse like this. Right? And, and this guy will, will have these indices. So um, the same thing happens, for example, imagine that we have this vector. It's, it's a contravariant vector. So if I try to compute the covariant vector field, it complains. This, this is mathematical for do not complain too much. Um, but again, for example, I can do it manually, right? I can contract the metric with that. So what do we do to set the fact that uh, this is the, the metric? We use this command, which is the, it, it's, it's a bit like the equivalent of def metric in, in extensor. So I do that. This could be computed from the metric, but I, it's generally good to help. So this means there will be three plus and one minus in the signature of the metric. So now we can do that. Now, now this works automatically, and this is a scalar. Right? Or if I raise one of the indices, I get the identity, of course or this is the inverse metric, as we saw before. Right? So these, these raising and lower, lowering indices can be done because we did this step. Again, what's the determinant of the metric? It's that, it's negative here, and you see, we keep track of the density, density character. And here, it's, there's something funny. So epsilon, which is a <clears throat> four index tensor, is a tensor, right? Remember, don't confuse it with the eta up and down uh, densities. But again, it, that, that, that gets a bit complicated. I'm not going to go to that. So the components of the metric, this is just Mathematica's way of, of expressing a sparse array, just to avoid showing all these components. Um, so that's that's what this object has inside. And, and notice this is a scalar. This is not a density. Okay. Differentiation. So we have the metric, right? So what's the covariant derivative of the metric? So we have this object. So the way we are going to do it, and here all these things are bothering me. I need to go small. Yes, so th this is the main con construction. So we are going to have 
the co this object, sick of D, the component covariant derivative. Here we specify some derivative, typically one of the parallel derivatives. Here we say the Christoffel. And here, if the metric derives, if the covariant derivative derives from a metric, we put it there. If not, we just put null. So, again, notice how the Christoffels are differences between two covariant derivatives. So, the derivative that is being represented here is that whose difference with this one is this Christoffel. So, that's why we store the Christoffel inside. And, for example, the, the levitsch vita connection of, of of this partial metric will be related to the derivative that knows how to differentiate our scalars and vectors. And this is the Christoffel. This is the Christoffel. This is what we typically show us the Christoffel of, of Sparshall. And here we, we still store the metric to remember ourselves that this derivative comes from a metric. So now, right, we had our vector. Now we can differentiate it and see, you see, this expression is exactly the same one as we would use in, in X tensor, right? It's just that CD is now this object. But this object works exactly as we would expect. It returns another, now it returns a two in the C tensor, which is that one. If we try to differentiate the metric, of course it gives zero, right? Because it's the Levitsch-Civita connection of that metric. So again, how do we get the Christoffel? Well, we do the same thing we did before. It's the Christoffel of this derivative minus this derivative, which is that guy. If we put indices, that's the Christoffel. Or if we want to see it expanded, as usual, we do that, which is not super nice. This doesn't look in nice. And, and this, this, I mean, this it's because Mathematica sorts things the way it wants, but it would be nicer to put this in front, right? And then perhaps uh, there's a product or something like that. But not needed here because we have the indices. But you do understand what this means. This may be the, the standard way of presenting Christopher. Let's do other things. For example, commutation of derivatives. We commute that derivative with that derivative. Remember that they are sick of this, and this is a C tensor but we use exactly the same notation as in extensor. We get that. And if we just compare that object called com, this whole thing, with what we would get by multiplying the Riemann, right? so this guy, this guy again, is the full Riemann tensor of the uh, four, four levels of the spatial metric. So we have that, and and they don't look identical because there's a transposition. So I can just do to canonical simplify in this case can do it, because what simplify does with equations is that it moves this side to the other side, and then once this tensor sees the other one, they say, oh, we have different indices, so we better one of us switches, and then they they get aligned, they do the subtraction, and we get zero. Portion is zero, the Ricci is zero, and the Riemann is what we saw before. Right, so that's the Riemann of um, this version metric. And again, we now do unset symmetric, and now we still have MET. MET is still there as a tensor, but now it's not capable of raising and lowering indices. Right? So that's, that's the role of this guy. And that's useful because now, for example, I can go and use a different metric because I'm doing experiments with a different metric. Right? Okay, and to finish the part on component computations, let's do something non-trivial. I mean, more difficult than working with this version. Let's see if there are questions. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is the way to deactivate all these messages that the uh, exact functions send. So let's do it here. And so now we will not get all defining, defining, defining. 
So this is again the Boyer Linkwitz coordinates. Notice how I am reusing the scalars. This is fine. But if you really need to use different scalars, uh, then use different names, capitals or whatever. Again, I define three symbols, mass, rotation, charge, and they are going to be printed like that, like those. And we have to define the scalar. Now, and I, I repeat again, we, these are scalar fields. So we need to put the brackets here. This, this is annoying, I understand, and, and people have complained, but it, it has to be done this way because if we don't put these brackets, then we cannot use extensor to do the computations. And we want to use extensor to do all these computations. So, so that's the metric. And here I, I, I'm still using basis notation, not the D's and partials, but I could use these and partials. And now I extract just the, the array. So I convert that into a C tensor. So that's our C tensor for the Kernigman metric in Boyer linguist coordinates. Now, there is this function, which is a function specialized in computing everything about curvature. So for harder metrics like this one, it will know how to simplify internal computations. It can be parallelized because, of course, independent computations, independent components can be computed independently. So here you can specify what to compute. This will compute all it can, including the Kretschmann scalars and things like that. If you want to compute less, step by step, you can put here what you want to compute. And so this means compute from this metric in this coordinate system, so differentiations will be performed in Boyer linguist coordinates and we do this. So it's launching four kernels. Cloud Connect. Sorry. Let me work this one. Okay. Sorry, I'm using a development version of Mathematica. I should have used 12.1. So th this is the version we are working on. We'll be ready in, in uh, later this year. So yeah, so that's why it's complaining about. Uh, let me evaluate this again and see. I'm worried. That something in parallelism is okay. Well, it took a bit longer than I expected, but it did it apparently. So yeah, so this computed all derivatives of everything and tensors in various upper and lower positions and things like that. So now we can extract information, and now rather than this being a computation, it's just extraction of imp of information. So this this is faster. So we construct, the, this is a seek of D object again, and we can say, what's the rich scalar? What's the um, Ricci? Right? So that's, that's the Ricci object. So what's the Kretschmann scalar? And you see, it, it, it's already simplified. So this, this already went through simplify. So it looks, gives the results nicely. So what is Riemann? So we get that. So this is another thing. When, to avoid these boxes to be huge, when the components are too large, they, they show these blobs. So at least you see where the non-zero components are. Now, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see this. It's perhaps too small, but this is showing the value. Of course, you can manually extract component by component, but this is showing the components of, of each of, of uh, right? of, of, of the remnants. 
And let's do something like checking the Bianchi identity. This is a component computation. So we are actually using the Kerr Newman uh, metric to do these things. So this is, a, this is a different way of computing a covariant derivative. We are just taking, again, this object, Riemann CD. Let's show it. Hmm, what happened? Sorry, my screen just... Sorry, I something happened with some. Are you seeing my screen right now? Are you seeing the notebook? Yep, I think we can see it. Okay, just that I, I don't see the, the standard green framework that I see all the time. Okay, uh, let's continue. So yes, so this is the this is the C tensor to, to show more. Right, so that's the whole expression there. Of course, very inefficiently because it's repeating components. Um, right, but but you have all the information there. So, yes. So this thing computes the derivative. It's immediate because, as I said, it was already computed. And now what you, we have to do now? This is a tensor with five indices because this had four. This added a new one, and so we just have to comp do this computation and to simplify, so we get zero. Right? So we have checked that uh, the Bianchi identity, the second Bianchi identity is, is obeyed in this metric. And now what somebody was asking before, how do you change to a non-coordinated basis? So we are going to change to rotating basis of Kerniman, right? And this is a change of basis we define a new frame and we, we tell the system that now this one is going to be blue and use this change of base with respect to Boyer linguist. So now for example, uh, that's the those that's the matrix of change of basis, that's the inverse. And if we had a a, a vector like this one in Boyer linguist, if we change it to to the frame, uh, the rotating frame, it will be this vector. Okay, so now we can define the metric in uh, this frame. Notice that we are given the C tensor, the Kerniman metric in the rotating frame is a C tensor which is now diagonal. Right, so these two terms can be shown. These two are too large, but, but we see the metric is diagonal now in this frame. And, and actually, we can compare the two metrics. Right? They, they are identical. The metric we defined before for Ken Newman and the metric we have right now. Okay, so we do metric compute again. This should be faster because computations are easier in this frame, right? And we can still do everything. So we can uh, extract, you know, the Ricci, for example. And now Ricci looks much nicer in this case, right? It looks diagonal because we are using a good frame. Again, the Kretschmann, which has, it's a, it, it is a scalar, so it's identical to what we computed before, or the Riemann, which again looks a bit nicer in this case. So, yeah, let, let me put indices here. Right. And so, if you remember the structure of components, they were like circles. Now, now it's different in this frame. Okay, um, 
what something else that we can do, this is a mathematical function, we can check the symmetries. This is a mathematical language, meaning minus one if you, if you exchange indices three and four, minus one if you exchange indices one and two, one if you exchange this pair with this pair. And you can compute this for an intensor. And again, let's do this. So this is the, again the check of the Bianchi identity for for this guy. Okay, so this was another example of computing with a less trivial metric than, than this version. And again, um, we have many things defined, several bases defined, several charts defined, and so we have to undo things in reverse. We first uh, the Jacobians, then we undefined all the bases. Remember, I, I deactivated all these messages, so we don't see any messages here, right? And uh, so everything is fine. In this case, I'm actually going to kill the kernel to start again. Okay, uh, so it's 30, we have 30 minutes more. Any question here before I go to the final uh, small introductions of packages? I know it's, it's a lot for, for the same time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good that you get an idea of, of the things that can be done and how difficult it is um, to do. I know, I know that Excova feels a bit heavier than Extensor, precisely because it insists in doing things with Extensor, of, of imitating the notations of Extensor. Okay, so let's go to perturbation theory, just in case you happen to be needing this. Sorry, I forgot to look at the questions before. How to look for a specific component, one, two? Yes, so remember these indices. So you would just have to say KN metric RF, and then in brackets, one comma frame, two comma frame. That will give you the components in the frame. Right? So remember, always specifying the number and the frame you want. The number by itself doesn't mean anything to score. You always have to put together the name with a frame. That those are the some called marked indices. Um, okay, so let's go to expert. So this loaded expert, and again, expert realizes it needs extensor, which it needs experm, etc. And this one starts by changing some of the configuration variables because these are the values needed during work with uh, with expert. So what are, what are we going to do here? So in order to do perturbations, we need, well, these are metric perturbations, right? That's a very important thing. So we first define a metric. Now I'm going to call it G and the covariant derivative is, is CD. Let me see if I can put this a bit smaller again. Right. And now there is this new command, def metric perturbation. So it, it takes the background metric G and defines the perturbation H with parameter epsilon. So this is the small perturbation parameter. And here we have one of my worst decisions in the system, which was putting the order of perturbation together with the indices rather than putting it together with the name. I, I, I still might change these one day because this looks really ugly. Um, yeah, so imagine that we have the metric G minus A minus B comma three. Perturbed is going to perturb it and it's going to show it in this way. It's going to treat G as the background metric, and then it's going to show you the metric expanded in this way. So this is the first perturbation, second perturbation, third perturbation. You can go to any order. I, I have played examples with 10th order. Um, 
And then perturbation goes directly to just that order, right? So distinguish perturbed, which is a full object. Perturbation is just perturbation at third order. So we're going to color these, these colors, the, the indices of perturbations in red. So they are easier to uh, identify. But that, that thing is just that thing. This, is, this stands for label index. It's not a true index, it's not a tensorial index. It's just a label. So what can we do with this? So imagine that you want the perturbation of the inverse metric. So you call, this is the key function, expand perturbation. So it's going to convert perturbations of the uh, metric tensors into expansions in H. So that's the thing. Or you can expand just a given order and you get that. And again, exact has expert, but has formulas to go directly to these things. It contains something called the Fa di Bruno formula, which is used for, for high order differentiation. So this is all of, about differentiation, of course. So yeah, so if you compute the metric per turf to third order and the inverse per turf to third order, you can multiply those two objects and expand. We get that lots of times. Now we do contract metric and to canonical as usual. And you see, well, it, it looks better here. This is mathematical, collect. So we get the delta plus corrections of order four, five, and six, as expected. Let me change the Riemann again, and we can do we can do perturbations of all curvature tensors, right? So, for example, that's that's the first perturbation of Riemann, which is well-known. And now, if we sort derivatives, we get that with um, four double derivative terms, right? The the rest of the terms are Ricci terms, sorry, Riemann terms coming from reordering derivatives. And if you want this in flutter space-time, just kill all these Riemann tensors. So th this term is well known. Now, for example, what happens with the fourth derivative of Riemann? Sorry, fourth perturbation of Riemann. We can do exactly the same thing. Right? It's not a small expression, but if you need it, it's there. Okay, so we undo everything. So now we don't have the perturbation structure, we don't have the metric. Now, is this useful for something? Well, it turns out, and this is something we discovered a posteriori, that this is used a lot to do variational derivatives. And to show that, I'm going to load Teake's uh, extras. It's another package, exact. So the ACS loads invar, Xcova, C manipulator, actually expert as well, but expert was loaded. So we do this, we construct a metric. Um, I'm going to rename the tensors. And now extras, extras upgrades variational derivatives. And now variational derivatives suddenly becomes a lot more powerful. So remember that it took 10 seconds to compute uh, before this computation. So now this gives immediately the result. And this is done with expert internally. All these computations are just rereading the expert formulas in some uh, clever way. Um, Extras adds this new command together with bar D, which is called bar L, which adds the square roots of the determinants of the metric for U. So we can do that. And so we change Ricci to Einstein. We sort the indices, and there we have it, the Einstein tensor, without having to go to uh, derivatives of the metric. So this is being used for some people 
to use this, uh, to study these F of R theories, right, which, in which they handle Lagrangians, and, and, and I mean, F of R and Lagrangians that are more complicated than, than functions of, of Ricci scalar. For example, if you start with this object, the square of Ricci, we can also compute the variational derivative with respect of the metric of that object. We do the same thing as usual, contract metric to canonical, and there we have it, the new equations. Or even Riemann squared. Same thing. Always contract the metrics, do to canonical, to canonical is always the final step. And there we have it again. So here we have the Gretschmann scalar, etc. So extract is very powerful. Um, it has many interesting commands. Is that it does a bit of um, young tableaus, um, com computing and killing stuff. Yeah, it's, it's worth looking at, um, at at what is here. Okay, and not now, but but yes, it loaded tons of stuff. So I'm going to kill the kernel again and start afresh with the next, which is the final package I want to show. Let's see. Okay, it seems that Leo has answered all the questions here. Thanks for that. Um, yes, so we are going to have a look at another final package, which is called Invar. So I wanted to show Invar because it's a good example of how to use exact, essentially as brute force computation. So the, um, the question here is the following. In dimension four, we know that the Riemann tensor has 14 independent scalar freedoms. So it has 20 independent components by symmetry, and we can subtract the six uh, Lorentz rotations. So if we form like many, many scalars, polynomials of the Riemann tensor, they must obey of many identities because in the end, only 14 scalars are independent. So how can we handle that in a practical way? How can we go from some polynomials to others? Well, here is the simple idea. With exact, we just can pre-compute all possible identities up to, seven, up, to seven, up to some specific order, of course. And what we will do, this is what we did um, a few years ago, we computed all possible polynomial identities of Riemann up to seven Riemanns. And, if, and then we generalized to handle derivatives going up to 12 derivatives of the metric, meaning that we could have 10 derivatives of a single Riemann, because a single Riemann is two derivatives, or we could have the product of, for example, two Riemanns, each of them differentiated four times, right? So that would be two plus two, four plus four, so total 12. So what we ended up having is more than half a million identities and we just tabulated them all. So if you find yourself having to work with polynomials of Riemann, this is what you need. And again, people working with F of R theories and things like that need these things. So, right, so let me show you an example. Again, we will need lots of indices. So this says all letters from A to C are going to be indices. This is our metric. Um, right. I'm going to change the typesetting of these two tensors. And now we do the following. This function, an invar function, gives me a random Riemann polynomial, monomial, better, in which the first Riemann is differentiated zero times, the second twice, the, sec the third twice. So there we have it as a scalar. And you see this is differentiated twice, this is differentiated twice, this, this is not differentiated. So what we have is a way of identifying this invariant in the, in the database. Sometimes this is zero by symmetries. Right, so let's try again. Okay, here is one. 
So of the 0 to 2 invariants, this happens to be 231. And I, as I said, there, there are millions of these when we consider the full database. So now this is going to consult the databases of various sizes and express this object in a unique way, which is that one. So there is a basis of these objects and they are well identified, which are a basis for all the other Riemann polynomials. So this is the internal notation in Inval. Now, if we want to go back to Riemanns, we need to consult the database again, and there we have it. Th that's a unique expression for that Riemann polynomial we found. Looks complicated, but it's unique. So if you find, if you have a polynomial in which you have several of these, you convert them into a unique form, and if that thing, that thing is zero, Inval will find it with a limitation of up to seven remands. And so here we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Right. Okay. Um, right. Just for fun, let's go to one of the biggest cases, the cases with, with 12 metric derivatives. So now this Riemann, for example, has four derivatives. Again, we see whether it gives zero by symmetry. Yeah, I, I saw it here. So that, that's obviously zero. Let's try again. Right. So that's the 22,000 invariant of this um, class. So we simplify it. Simplify in, in, in quotes. So that's a big expression, and it will look even bigger with Riemanns. Okay, so that, that's enormous. But as I said, that's a unique expression of this thing. Okay, and our my final slide is what happens if you uh, so. Yes, after having this expression, the question is, how do you copy that to LaTeX, right? You are very happy with that final expression. You want it in a paper. But how do you copy that to LaTeX? Well, we have the perfect tool for that too, which is this package called TextAct. So we load TextAct. Okay, so let's see how many terms did we have there, 202. Okay, I've seen worse than that, but that's fine. So the main function in TextAct is this one, TechPrint. It just takes the expression and produces LaTeX. And it's LaTeX that is careful with where the indices go, so they will not be placed one on top of another and things like that, right? So there you have your expression. And this works for any tensor. It's in this case, just Riemann tensor, so they are all R's but uh, it can be any tensor. You can control the details of typesetting. Now, the problem with these is that this is a single line, so it's too long. So we need a separate function. So that's called tech, tech break. So tech break is very powerful. It can break in various ways at various places. It can add additional things in the process, etc. It's very powerful. Um, Thomas Bachtal has worked a, a lot on this, and, and Barry too. Barry Wardle. And um, right, so let's do it with with default parameters. So you see, it will it added it broke the expressions in various places. It added the switches. Yeah. So we are almost ready. We just have to. I mean. Because you want, you may want to put that in various places. You have to add the beginning and final marks. That's all that's needed. So we just, we now have that thing. And now we can do two things. This needs some configuration of the system. 
Okay, so that um, let's see. Um, what's this? Sorry, I've lost my screen. So, are, are you seeing are you seeing the tech expression? Yes, I can see the, the text. Okay, yeah. So you see how nicely it broke the expression, so that it feeds the page, etc. And here you have all the indices, nicely typeset, with semicolons as, as we instructed, etc. Right. So there we have a rich scale as we can act. We can ask the system to replace these things by rich scalars if we want, etc. Right. Okay, so I'm almost done. Yes, so this will also send the whole thing to a file. So, okay, so I think that's my final conclusion, my final slide. And so, I hope by now I have convinced you of the power of exact, which is a collection of currently 20 packages of Wolfram language code. They together implement extensive and efficient functionality for tension computations, both for abstract and component computations. So that's something you have to be careful when you go and use a system because many systems out there only do component computations, not the abstract part. So, we use slightly non-standard mathematical concepts like these Christoffel tensors and the concept of weights as, as linear combinations of bases. But this allows us to attack any expression because everything is well under control. No matter whether you mix you know, weights with lead derivatives and Jacobians and so over the last 15 years, already more than 500 references um, have used EXACT successfully. And um, there was a very nice review on Tensor Computer Algebra by Michael McCallum. It's a, it's a living review in relativity. And in his final section, he recommends EXACT as, as one of the few main recommended uh, general systems. Well. If you try, don't hesitate to ask questions in the exact forum or, or any other forum in which uh, uh, we may be, or send directly questions to me. So there are more things to do in exact, like constructing collections of metrics so that we don't have to type Kurt Newman again and again. Um, it would be nice to have utilities for metric classification to find killing vectors, etc. Something that it doesn't happen yet, and I get I get this question a lot. Yes, I do abstract metric theory perturbations. How do I do then perturbations of components? This cannot be done yet because expert and excova don't talk to each other yet. So that's uh, that's something to fix. And something I would like to do eventually is to add support to help in the development of numerics. Um, Yes, that's uh, future work. Okay, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you. Let's see. Here are some questions. About the general development of such computer algebra system. Is there a systematic way to test such systems, particularly the initial phase of our project when development is being done on individual level? Well, that's an interesting idea. I don't know. Well, I don't know of any collection of formulas that you might say these all have to be able to prove these formulas or to compute these results. That I don't know, but it's it's a very interesting idea, certainly. Yes. Um, well, for example, with EXACT, I would challenge other systems to try to compute these um, Riemann identities. That, that's something I have pre-computed, so. but I, I cannot think of other things. We have, of course, basic results that you have to show that these solutions are solutions to Einstein's equations and things like that. Uh, is there functionality to produce C code from a tensor expression? 
Well, uh, Mathematica itself has capabilities to produce C code from Wolfram language code. So I don't have anything else to add to that. But I, I, I would expect that with that you can convert into C most of the things you might need, like loops, etc. Got an error, can't find the invar database. Yes, the invar database is so large, it's like a 250 megabytes compressed, so it, it, it compresses to 1.5 gigabytes, that you have to download it separately. Actu actually, it's into files. The small one, which allows to go to, I don't know, five or six remands, and the last step of seven remands, which is huge. Okay, thank you all for your uh, thank yous. And uh, I don't know if I've missed, if I've missed uh, any question here that still requires an answer, please let, let me know. Well, if you like it, please use it, download it, test it. And uh, if you have questions, go to the forum. There are very simple introductory questions, even questions about Wolfram language itself, or very advanced questions. Sometimes we discuss actual mathematics there. Unfortunately, there are some questions of the form. Here you have 10 scanned pages of this book. Why don't you implement this for me? That, that we cannot do in general. But um, we are always happy to help people implementing things. The crank package supports generating cactus code, code using exact. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was using tensor tools, I think it was called. But well, I, I'm, I'm very happy to know that it supports exact already. Thank you. Thank you for telling me. Do you have a cheat sheet? Sorry, I don't know what's that. Common functions, oh, I see. Mm, no, no, what I would recommend is to go to the doc files. There are doc files, each, each, each package which ha will have its own doc file. Let's have a look at them. Again, if you're not seeing the exact web page, let me know. And uh, um, yeah. Let's download, I don't know, extensive, for example. So this file is in the, is in the distribution, of course. The, the documentation directory contains all these documentation files. So, so this file, let me put it bigger again. Um, it, the, the, there is there is usually an example session. So if you want to start, this is where I would start with examples from the example session. Which some of them I've, I've taken for this um, for this tutorial. And then then here you have sections dedicated to the various parts. So this goes into a ton of detail. Lost my um, here. Yep. Okay. Well, I think it's time. Um, so perhaps I'm gonna stop here. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to